Good morning. Um, morning. Wanted to, uh, while we're waiting for Mr. O'Grady to come with uh, a, some new language that uh, he's been uh, developing at my request that uh, originates in some work done by uh, Conservation Law Foundation. It's just as more, uh, another take on PFAS for us to, to look at, but in terms of Stepping away from that for a moment, I'd like to talk about calendar generally. So we have eight days. We have four this week, meeting with break, four when we get back. Um, and we're trying to wrap up three bills, uh, the Clean Water Bill, PFAS Bill. We have four this week, four, four next, next week, week, then town meeting break. <coughs> oh, sorry. Yes. I misspoke. So we have basically eight days that I'm hoping that we'll use to uh, finish up our work. The Twelve days we'll, before crossover. Yes. Um, who knows? Sometimes we end up with a little more wiggle room than that, but I'd like to aim to be on that schedule. In terms of the clean water work, so I met with Mr. Chapman on Friday, uh, Michael Grady since, and um, there's some language. He's doing some drafting to help us have a next draft. We'll come back to it later this week. Um, but in terms of the choices we had on the governance side of things, we, there was business as usual was one model. Um, uh, another model said let's um, rely on RPCs to be an outside convener facilitator. There was also the uh, A&R model of creating these district utilities. Uh, and I, we, I think we heard enough uh, pushback on that utility model that the draft that's being developed uh, presents sort of a hybrid model based on RPCs being the default convener at the state level. With, uh, again, with block grants out to people and uh, an enhanced process to make sure that everyone at the table <coughs> has um, an equal opportunity to present best projects and that's what we do for you. So you'll see language for that later this week. Meanwhile, we, we're turning back to PFAS while that language is being developed. And while all those parties at the table have a chance to digest that and provide additional feedback so we can use some tuning. Um, and then next week we'll be getting um, to plastics uh, as well as trying to, uh, as well as finishing up um, on water and PFAS. So. That's the lay of the land. That's our calendar for the next eight days. Any thoughts, questions, suggestions, comments? Okay. With that then, um, as I mentioned, um, uh, Mr. Grady's worked with Conservation Law Foundation on um, formalizing some language that they were proposing, and I just wanted to um, bring it before the committee as part of us thinking through how we might um, make progress on regulating PFAS in uh, ground, sorry, in surface waters and in drinking water. So with that, Mr. Grady, thank you. We'll also be hearing from Mr. Chapman and Ms. Duggan to talk about it some more. There are, and just uh, one last note about it, uh, there are, aspects of this that I think uh, that differ from S49, and maybe, Michael, if, as you're working along, if there's major points of difference, you could help point them out, uh, because we have some choices to make as to how we regulate. Uh, my own preference is that we uh, put ourselves in a more uh, fast-track timeline than uh, a slower timeline for making those, those changes in rule and statute. Okay, stop there. So do you all have the proposed language? It looks like Senator Rogers has it. I, I think it's everybody. Okay. Um, so generally, just a refresher, S49 as introduced had a finding section regarding the um, presence of PFAS substances uh, in the environment, the potential health effects, the, the Department of Health um, issuing a health advisory level at 20 parts per trillion for five of those substances. 
um, the ability um, of a &R to adopt them as an MCAL, but have not as of yet, um, and to adopt a precautionary approach to the regulation of PFOS that the state should adopt a MCL, a maximum contaminant level in drinking water for, for PFOS under the Vermont Water Supply Rule, that water quality criteria or effluent limitations for PFOS be established under the Vermont Water Quality Standards, so that's for surface water, and that standards for the treatment of landfill leachate prior to treatment in a wastewater treatment facility would be discharged would be required prior to discharge to state waters. What the proposed language in front of you does is it still addresses an MCL for um, the five PFAS substances in uh, the water supply rule, directs the agency to undergo a process of whether or not an MCL could be established for all PFAS categories or compounds, directs the agency to explore um, and then ultimately adopt a surface water quality standards for PFOS compounds and then gives the agency ability to collect dot data regarding the sources of PFOS substances and then directs or gives the agency the ability to require any permanent entity to undergo monitoring for a PFAS substance where there has been a Department of Health advisory level issued for that substance provided that that requirement would only be part of the permit for two years. So that's generally what happens. The bill has evolved. Um, you'll see in um, page one, uh, section one, there is the requirement for DEC's water supply rule to have a maximum contaminant level for PFAS. Um, on page one, line six, sub A, You'll see on report February 2020, ANR shall file a final proposed rule with the Secretary of State and LCAR that adopts the Vermont Department of Health's advisory for PFOA uh, perfluorooctane sulfonic acid, perfluorohexane sulfonic acid, perfluorononic acid, and perfluorheptadonic acid as an MCSL, MCL. So you did that in S49, or Senator Bray proposed that in S49, but Senator Bray did it in a different way. Senator Bray's language actually amended the rule, the DEC water supply rule, to establish 20 parts per trillion as the MCL for PFOA. This does it in a different way. It just directs the agency to do it by um, a certain date. Now that February 1st, 2020 date is the date that the rule will be filed with the Secretary of State and LCAR. LCAR has 45 days to review per statute, and then per statute, unless otherwise noted, the effective date is 30 days from LCAR approval. So really, the MCL for these PFOA, those five PFOA substances would go, PFOS substances would be mid-April of 2020, not February of 2020. Can we pause while we're here since this is a different route to getting there than the original the bills introduced? Uh, can you say something about pros and cons of doing this route versus saying we, we already have these levels elsewhere in law, let's uh, borrow them and carry them over and apply them to water through statute? So a pro and con of what's the pro of S49 is that approach of amending the rule directly is that it goes into effect when you want it to go into effect on passage or at whatever date you want it to go into effect. So immediacy is probably the biggest pro there. Some people might say that, that you're binding the agency by amending a rule through statute. Um, I don't agree with that. I think this gives the agency the ability to amend this rule in the future if they wanted to. Um, if you adopted the MCS, MCL in statute and not as part of the rule, then there would be a lack of flexibility for the agency. Mm -hmm. But by doing it in rule, the agency still has its rulemaking authority to amend the rule in the future. 
the pro of doing it the agency <laughs> the what's proposed in the alternative language is that you know the agency maintains that it's the expert on these issues and that they should be the one that is uh, adopting standards that are health based or science based typically they do they are that entity um, and there is time in the rulemaking process to take in public notice and comment as part of the mandated public participation process so the agency can respond to particular or unique issues or concerns that are raised during that process. Is there a way to have a hybrid process so that we can write it into a statute with an earlier effective date and then kick off the rulemaking in case it should be revised up or down or expanded because we now characterize the sixth PFAS family chemical by next year? Sure. Um, you did something similar in, in the stormwater interim rules in 2004. You adopted a statute or standard and said that that standard was in place until the agency adopted rules. And uh, the adoption of the rules effectively became a contingent repeal of that, that interim standard. Would it be sort of would it be inconsistent with rulemaking to say that the rule shall not be uh, more I don't know, lenient than the interim standard? Would it be that's prejudging the outcome of the rulemaking? Well, you're the you're the policymaking body. If you want to say that that's the delegated authority. Then you can say that as, as at least two of you know who served on Alcar. Alcar, in the not recently, has been requesting more detail or more specificity in the delegation to the agencies of rulemaking, um, and so that that's that's up to you if you want to say that it can't be any less stringent than the Department of Health advisory level. Um, I don't think, I don't know what's happening in the document post, but last week we were looking at a list of chemicals for which there are health advisories, but there are no MCLs established. Is that? And I'm just wondering if, um, well, one, if you could provide the committee with a copy of that, and then I guess I'll have a question for agency later on. I don't know why we would not move forward with an MCL when we have a health advisory established, unless I'm misunderstanding the significance of a health advisory and the ability of the agency to create an MCL based on a health advisory. So why the agency doesn't go forward with an MCL for when there's a health advisory, that's, that's a question for the agency. Yep. They do have authority in the water supply rule. In my opinion, they have authority to adopt it without going through rulemaking. There's a provision that says where there is a health advisory for a contaminant and no MCL has been issued, the agency can adopt the Department of Health advisory level as an MCL. Uh, I believe it's the agency's assertion that they would have to do that through rulemaking. That doesn't make sense to me because they, why would you need that language? Because they can adopt it as an MCL otherwise under their general authority to adopt an MCL. Um, they don't really need specific language to adopt by rule a health advisory. Um, but that's the agency they sometimes they adopt it, sometimes they don't. That's right. how we get ourselves into a, a twisted up on the on the rules with some my, my, my point is, I, I don't necessarily think they need to adopt it by rule, um, but that's the agency's interpretation. They're the entity charged with implementing it, so generally they get discretion in their interpretation. Okay. So what's the other legal tool that you define an MCL by if it's not adopted? I, I think that they could just enforce it as, as, as the end, right, because they have that authority in whatever it is, 6-15.
Um, you were citing a statute that allows them to take um, health advice from turn it into an MCL. Can you? It's not a statute. It's uh, it's in their water supply rule. Okay. It is uh, not water supply rule section six point fifteen. It says for contaminants which may be detected in a public water system for which MCLs or MCLDs have not been adopted and the Vermont Commissioner of Health has established a Vermont Health Advisory Level for it, the Secretary may adopt the advisory level as an MCL or MCLG. So that, the key word there is adopt. Um, does that mean by rule or does it mean effectively suggest enforce? My opinion, you don't need this section if it's uh, a requirement to go to rulemaking because they already have the ability to adopt an advisory level as an MCL. <coughs> uh, Senator Campion. <clears throat> I guess a couple of things. So this allows, we're allowing the Secretary of Natural Resources to basically have additional powers to protect people's health and the environment. And we're giving it for just a two-year period, or no? No. I'm just looking at page four. Well, page four is, is <laughs> it's not what we're talking about now. Right. Um, but yes, that is an additional authority. It gives the, the agency the ability to, um, to, to monitor the facility, any permitted facility um, for any constituent for which a health advisory has been established. Generally, the agency has in its permits the ability to do reopeners and, and impose condition. But I think the issue here is generally that's for the chemicals that are regulated under that that area of law and so this is really about when there's chemicals of emerging concern to give them that specific authority to have that type of <coughs> permitting condition permitting requirements um, when there's a health advisory it doesn't specifically say chemicals of emerging concern which is probably good it's really just kind of bootstrapping onto their existing permitting authority and allowing it to go further um, than those listed chemicals in existing programs. So then and it is only, it, it would only be there for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, that effectively gives them two years to adopt a rule uh, for that program. So what, are, what do you see as the greater impacts and, you know, of you know, when we move forward with this? What, what are sort of the positive ramifications? Well, can we're going to have people respond, right. whether it's business or the state, to do cleanups. Sure. Actually, can we pause on that yeah. some? And uh, I asked a bunch of questions that got us into the weeds a little bit on, on page one. So maybe before we go into that, good sure. question. If we finish the walkthrough, then we'll be in a better position to see how that fits. So February 2020, you get an MCL for the five PFAS, listed PFAS substances. Beginning August 1, 2020, the agency initiates a public notice and comment process, and this is page one, line 14, um, regarding regulation under the water supply rule of PFAS substances as a class or subclass. And then on or before March of 2020, 2021, ANR, either files a proposed rule to regulate PFAS substances as a class or subclass under the water supply rule or it publishes a notice of why it is not doing that and including the impediments to such a rule. And then on page two, line nine, if ANR proposes a rule to regulate PFAS uh, as a compound or class under the water supply rule, it files that rule by December 31st, 2021. Should we move on? Uh, questions? Yes, please. Page 2, line 14, section 2. This is a directive on or before January 15, 2020, for ANR to publish a plan for adoption of surface water quality standards for PFOS substances. And at a minimum, 
It shall address a water quality standards for the five listed PFAS substances and then PFAS classes or compounds or subgroups. And then on or before January 1, 2024, they file a final rule to adopt the surface water quality standard. I do note that EPA came out with an action plan for PFAS uh, on uh, last week and they note that uh, one of their long-term actions is to determine if available data and research support the development of Clean Water Act 304 ambient water quality criteria mm -hmm. and then when adopted by states and tribes uh, as water quality standards that can be used to set permit limits. They have their time frame as 2021. So there is some discrepancy about how much time is needed to develop the information to issue a water quality standard. EPA seems to say that they'll have that data by 2021 and the language in front of you has 2024. That may account for rulemaking. But I just wanted to note that it's a lot of rulemaking time. Okay. Well, right. especially given that we're trying to pick up the pace. Mm -hmm. But I know this is a broader reach. Okay, so I'm flagging mine with EPAs at 2021. On page 3, line 11, section 3, this directs the agency on or before May 1, 2019, to publish a plan for a complete statewide investigation of potential sources of PFAS contamination as part of the investigation. Um, they shall evaluate a representative portion of public water systems for the total oxidizable PFAS concentrations and they shall initiate implementation of the plan later than July of 2019. In honor before July of 2020, all public water systems shall conduct monitoring for the maximum number of PFAS detectable from standard laboratory methods or list of specific PFAS. Um, so my question there is cost. The, the EPA says that method 537 is an existing testing method that includes the Gen X chemicals and additional PFAS, but they are developing new drinking water methods for additional short chain PFAS not measured by method 537. They think that the original revision of method 537 has, has already been done November 2018 and they will have additional methods in 2019. Um, so there seems to be testing that would be available. It doesn't say how much it costs. And the reference to total oxidizable PFAS concentration, as I understand it, that's a uh, test that is less specific and broader. Well, it, it doesn't identify necessarily the specific PFAS. It, it notes that there is a PFAS present. So it's like a class. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, page four, line four, section four, as Senator Campion was questioning, this does give the agency to require any permitted entity um, to monitor their facility drainage emission or release pretty much every regulated activity that the agency has for which a health advisory has been established. They may impose conditions on a permanent entity based on the health advisory. Um, and then as Senator Campion noted it on um, page four lines 11 to 13, it would only be there for two years. But as I noted, that likely gives the agency time to either um, do rulemaking uh, or address the issue in um, their permit. Page four, line 14 to 16, on or before January 1, 2020, ANR shall publish a guidance document for public review that sets forth the detailed practices for implementation of their ability to require any per permanent entity to monitor. And then on or before January 1, 2020, they shall publish for public review and comment a plan to collect data 
for contaminants in drinking water for which a health advisory has been established, but no MCIL has been adopted. Everything goes under effect on passage. My one um, note on language is that this is all session law. And I think um, for the rule directive in section one, that's kind of a, yeah, you could do it by session law, <coughs> you could do it in statute. Section two, the uh, publish a plan, that kind of makes sense to do in session law. The investigation of potential sources, um, that makes sense in session law. But then section four, page four, line five, sub A, this seems to be ongoing authority um, to require these conditions. There doesn't, there is no repeal proposed. That to me is something that should likely be in statute. Ongoing authority no um, time frame in which it can be used, no proposed repeal. I think that would be something that would normally go on statute. So you're reminding me that sometimes I don't think about where things are gonna land that way. So uh, in general, if there is a change to law that's going to, doesn't have a sunset built in, right? we'll put it in, or does have a, it's not going to end at a certain point. Let me put it in. If we, if we have that kind of a date in the session law because it's temporary, but otherwise the default is green books. The, our general policy is, is subject matter of limited duration or required by specific time frames um, that does not have ongoing effect we will put in session law. The appropriations bill, for example, every year, because by its own terms, it is only good for that fiscal year unless otherwise noted, it's all session law, um, because it's of a limited duration unless otherwise noted. Um, any other questions from Mr. O'Brady about, so coming back to your question, do you have a Ask that again. Well, just the impacts, I guess, what sorts of actions uh, will we see? In other words, once, um, you know, levels are a certain, you know, uh, standard, or what sorts of things will start to happen? The secretary will come in and, you know, mitigate those problems. Uh, certainly, there'll be people will know about those situations, that kind of thing is what I'm interested in. Okay. Well, we're gonna hear from both Mr. Chapman and Ms. Duggan, and they're um, more of the authors of this, so I think that'll be good to ask them and we'll hear about this, why they're promoting this construct in particular. I, I will say, you know, just to be a little repetitious, that what's troubling on mm -hmm. our work so far on this is how we are is perpetually hamstrung by the amount of data we have. Yeah. Okay. Ever, uh, if we can never assert anything beyond something for which we already have an MCL. Right. It, uh, if, you have a, if you can do five a year or 10 a year, and you have a list of 5,000. Uh, and in part, I guess, what I'm we're thinking in a bad, is- We're in a bad trajectory. Back to some of our conversations we've had around other waters upstream, are there things that we might want to add to this that would additional further contamination. Okay. I'm not sure I'm following. Like, well, well, for example, be? you know, I know that we have, you know, you know there are other PFOA-related bills either in this committee or in health and welfare. Are there things that should be attached to this to prevent contamination from continuing? Oh, I see. So stop adding. Stop it. adding and in addition to measuring. Okay. Well, I think part of the issue with PFAS and, and the other chemicals of major concern is, is you don't know that they're being used. There's, there's no requirement for many of them for it to be noted in a toxic use reduction plan because most of them are not going to be listed under the toxic substances in that subchapter. 
Uh, many of them are not EPRA, Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. Actually, one of the things that EPA recommends in their action plan is reviewing whether or not to add it to the Section 313 EPRA chemicals. Um, but you can, as a state, require EPCRA notification for a chemical or best chemicals. So you're saying, for example, there's... I mean, it's hard to regulate something that you don't know is there. Right. For example, you drafted a bill for us related to uh, keeping PFOAs out of food packaging. <clears throat> you're saying, <clears throat> again, we don't know that it's even in food packaging. It would just be prohibiting of manufacturing or use of it in the state if something like that were to pass. For all we know, it could be there may be nothing. Right, and, and <clears throat> so the bill that, that you have drafted yep. based on Seattle law, or actually Washington law, um, Washington state law, it, it requires that food packaging not have a PFAS substance if there is an otherwise available safe alternative. And so that requires a review by the by the manufacturer in order to sell in the state. Thanks. <clears throat> so we're talking about for the most part uh, just establishing standards, monitoring stuff like that, so that we know if you start doing what you're talking about there and. Restricting use in, is that restricting use in commerce or just notification? Um, they are both just notification. Okay. Yeah. So technically, under the Toxic Use Reduction Program, you're supposed to have a plan that ultimately leads to the reduction of the use of a chemical. But, and the agency may correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that plan is voluntary. <coughs> a positive one. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Brady? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to invite Ms. Duggan to join us at the table. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, thanks for your work um, on bringing forward some more language for us to be able to consider as we push on, trying to figure out how to do better on feedback. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about this construct versus what's in S49? Sure, yeah, and I think first I'll start off um, by just highlighting the fact that addressing PFAS contamination in the state is much larger than this particular bill. Um, and so, you know, there, because we, we've talked about this in the past, when you have emerging contaminants that are not on regulatory lists, they're not monitored, they're not being regulated um, through all the pollution control statutes, um, you know, the, the Toxics Use Reduction Act statute, um, you know, there is a need to address it in a comprehensive way. And there are lots of, you know, there are several bills um, this session that have been introduced that aim to get at that with respect to bans and products and, um, related to liabilities for people that have been exposed. <clears throat> so this, you know, our suggested language is really focused on drinking water and surface water. And so I think that I want to be clear and say that, you know, this is not all that we think needs to happen in terms of actually proactively addressing um, these toxics in the state, but this is, specific, a this is a step and is really focused on um, drinking water and surface waters. Um, you may recall that Conservation Law Foundation petitioned uh, the Agency of Natural Resources to set a drinking water standard. Um, we asked them to immediately adopt the health advisory um, and then initiate a process to set a standard for the class or subclass. The agency granted that petition with respect to the health advisory um, and said that they would continue to work on evaluating you know, how to regulate as a class or a subclass. Um, this 
the the legislation that you know the proposal that the language that we put forward is really um, to ensure that the agency is accountable to actually getting that work done and so you'll notice that there is a deadline um, for taking those actions both in terms of immediate adoption of the health advisory and then also that public process for evaluating regulation as a class or subclass. Um, and that's the 2024, correct? Is uh, that date? That would be, so, so for drinking water standard for the class, that process would start on August 1st, 2020. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that the, de the deadline for the collection of data, the water system data, that has to be done by July 1st, 2020. So that data collection will have been done. Um, so that can feed into that process for how we, you know, how the agency would regulate um, PFAS as a class or subclass. Um, there's also a deadline um, to adopt a surface water quality standard, and we've talked about the deadlines um, to complete the investigation of both potential sources of PFAS contamination, um, meaning what types of facilities do we expect PFAS to be released from. You know, the EP, uh, the ANR has done uh, some work to evaluate that, but there is still a long list um, of potential sources like car washes and tanneries and paint manufacturers and schools that the agency will still need to um, investigate. And then there is a deadline for all water systems to do comprehensive PFAS testing. So we would propose that it would be the maximum number of PFAS that can be quantified. And that number changes fairly frequently. Um, there is an EPA method, um, but most labs are also running what's called a modified EPA method 537.1. So they're actually testing for between 30 and 40 of these compounds. Um, can you just say something? Because, uh, you had introduced me to this total oxidizable uh, PFAS test. So can you uh, fill us in on what that sure. is able to do compared to what the 537.1 does? Sure. So there are certain labs that are running um, a total oxidizable precursor assay. It's called a top assay. Um, and that researchers and labs are, are scrambling to figure out how do we actually measure total PFAS? How can we see the total PFAS load in, a, in, in water and soil? This is one method that attempts to get a better sense of what the PFAS load could be. So um, I'm not a chemist, and you really want to talk with a chemist before, you know, really um, getting a full understanding of it. But what you know, sort of high, very high level, the the water is basically run for all the PFAS that can be quantified, and then there is a um, chemical reaction that happens to force the breakdown of other PFAS into the compounds that can be quantified. So you get a before number and an after number. So it's not, um, it does not give you total PFAS. It, you know, it's not certified by EPA, but it is another investigative tool to better understand the total PFAS that is in water or soil. And uh, on an earlier visit, you talked about an organofluorine test. Mm -hmm. is, is top just a more specific version? No, those are two different things. And um, there are some researchers that have identified extractable organofluorine um, test method as a surrogate for total PFAS. Um, but it's my understanding that commercial labs are not running that test um, at this time, that it is used on, you know, in smaller scale um, in academic 
uh, laboratories, but not commercially. And then one other test I've seen listed, I think it was called MLA 110, not 537. I Does don't know. Familiar? No, it doesn't. Okay. He's yeah. making it up. <laughs> Modern Language Association 110. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> okay. So I'll leave that one aside. All right, thanks. I just want to make sure we know the details yeah. of what we're looking at. Thank you. I think the other thing I would just highlight is that um, Section 4 uh, provides the agency with additional authorities to require monitoring to basically assess for where an emerging contaminant may be in the state. Um, and the deadlines also, you've highlighted the fact that we have um, health advisories where we have not established an MCL, where the agency has just not taken action. So this would require um, that the agency propose a plan for how they would close that gap between um, the health advisories that have been established and MCL, uh, where there, and where there has been no MCL set. Um, anything else you wanna say about how this is set up or? I mean, one thing we've talked about a little bit is uh, data collection. So, uh, and we were talking a little earlier about the, the, I was saying hamstrung by data collection. Mm -hmm. So if we want to do good work, we want it to be science-based. At the same time, there's the frustrating uh, foreseeable vision of saying, if we're picking up 20, 30 chemicals a year and it's a class of 5,000, it's a very long process to um, characterize all those. That's right. And is there, any precedent for saying we've characterized a sufficient number to now be legitimately, legally concerned about the class as a whole, mm -hmm. and we're gonna take a more precautionary approach towards addressing the whole. Have we done that with any other chemicals, and is that something that you could imagine us getting to in something like this? Well, I think that EPA has done that with respect to disinfection byproducts for a much smaller number compounds they they've said we don't actually have toxicity information for one of these um, one of the acids in that grouping but we have enough information to regulate these compounds together anyway um, I think that um, PFAS you've heard from Dr. Rose um, there are different types of PFAS so there are long chain and short chain there are C8, C7, C6, 5, 4, and so it may be possible to regulate um, PFAS in terms of subgroups or, or more than one group. Um, but there are, um, I think that we have enough information to know that all of these PFAS um, are not gonna be good, um, but there are differences between um, the different <coughs> structures, and so part of the um, you know, part of the, the thought behind requiring a deadline for the agency to consider this in a meaningful and transparent way with deadlines and data collection is to have that conversation um, about how we can regulate these as either a total class or a subclass rather than continuing to play this game of whack-a-mole and catch-up that we are never gonna win. Um, are you aware of any other states or jurisdictions that have taken a broader approach to PFAS, like a class approach? Not at this time. I mean, I think that there are lots of states um, that are talking about how to get out from under this chemical by chemical approach. Um, but I am not aware of any state that's moving forward and setting a drinking water standard for total PFAS. So there are some states that have banned um, I think Washington has instituted a ban on PFAS and firefighting foam, or there might be bans and you know other products. Um, but I'm not aware of any state that has set a drinking water standard for total PFAS. Um, um, we were discussing testing before outside of committee time, and you, I, I, as I remember, you were saying there are chemicals that can show up in some of the private lab panels on PFAS, 
but they're not allowed to explain what they're finding because they're covered in some way by patent law or proprietary information, intellectual property, something along those lines. Can you exp I don't can you explain yeah, I mean, correctly of, what that was one about? of one of the frustrating um, and really egregious aspects of the PFAS um, situation is that many of these compounds the structure itself is patented, is confidential. And so we can't know um, what that structure looks like. Um, they may be able to, certain labs may be able to run a test and quantify particular compounds that we can't see. So, you know, the public may go to a particular lab and say, I want you to run. Um, I want you to quantify as many PFAS as you can. And the lab may come back and say, here's a list of 40 that you, the public, can see. But they may actually be able to quantify more than 40, but those are just patented, they're protected. Um, so I'm sorry, what allows the public then to be aware of, of those and not others? What's happening? They're not, they're not protected. The chemical structure okay. itself is not under patent. And so it's something that, um, you know, that my organization is investigating, um, but it's very, um, that is one of the challenges with a class that's this large where you have some compounds that are still protected um, under patent law. Is that because they're newer? And there's, there's like a, a statute of limitations on for those kinds of I don't know the answer to that question, um, but it's something that we're investigating because it's, it, you know, the public has a right to know what types of toxics are in their community and their drinking water. So if the sample that I brought to the lab were my own blood plasma or blood, and they ran these panels and they found some of these protected chemicals, uh, patented chemicals in my blood, would they be unable to tell me that those things were present? I can't answer that question. I That's think that angle. it's unlikely that they would run I don't, it would depend on who's running it and for what reason. I just can't answer that question. Yeah. That would be a perverse outcome. Well, if your neighbor was polluting you and they found it and you asked the neighbor if they had that chemical, would they be allowed to say, we don't have to tell you? Well, one of the things that I think we've talked about before and that is part of a comprehensive strategy to address PFAS is to require, um, it's basically to, to require um, reporting under our state emergency planning and community right to know act. We have specific state standards, so um, you know, we can do that, the state could do that through rulemaking and actually add these to the list of things that need to be reported, things that are released in the environment, and I think, you know, um, Mr. O'Grady mentioned um, also Toxics Use Reduction Act, adding that to the list of things that companies have to disclose, consider, um, and then plan for how to reduce. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for this one? So thank you very much for helping us think our way along the, this learning curve. Um, I'd like to invite Mr. Chapman to join us at the table. Good morning. Good morning. So you've, you've heard the conversation so far, and um, I, I don't know, if, if just for lay of the land, are you more supportive of this approach to um, working on this topic than the underlying S49 bill? Uh, you know, I, I think that the approach that CLF has laid out with respect to having a number of, you know, fairly aggressive timelines for the agency to consider various standards is acceptable to us. I think that folks should understand that the timelines that are in there we view as being relatively aggressive, um, especially, you know, there are no resources being allocated in this, so this is basically taking people who are already doing work and adding additional work that they're going to need to do on some fairly complicated topics. Um, and we think that it's it's reasonable that we can do it within the time frames that we put out there. 
if, if you, um, if we proposed something that was working on a timeline that wasn't compatible with your current staffing, uh, is that something you would point out to us? I would point, I, I mean, I think that the underlying bill has significant resource limitations. I don't think that some of the things that are, are in that bill, uh, you know, certainly there is staffing and resource limitations. I, I'm not even sure with enhanced staffing and resources that they can be done within the time frames that are laid out. Is there an underlying, is there an associated permitting structure that would, could legitimately raise fees to help support additional work? No. So I don't know if, I mean, just sort of starting, uh, you know, just to, to address one issue that got raised with respect to the agency's authority to adopt health advisories as MCLs. The agency's interpretation of its own rules is that um, that particular adoption, in order under federal guidance to adopt an MCL, we're supposed to go through an incremental cost benefit analysis looking at various levels of risk and the cost associated with implementing treatment for them. Um, it's the agency's interpretation. We put that in there to basically say we don't need to go through that incremental cost benefit analysis in order to adopt a health advisory as a standard. Um, you know, we've looked at, um, we have had similar provisions in other rules giving us interim standard authority, and they've, you know, we have concerns about our ability to do that. Um, absence express statutory authority, and, and you frankly have given us the authority to adopt emergency rules, and we think that's the more appropriate and uh, laid out way to address emerging issues. And, and we've used it when we have to with respect to PFAS. Um, so I'm not sure from like the bill itself, do you want me to speak to the underlying bill? Do you want me to talk about CLS proposed amendment or are there specific issues you want me to go through? Um, I think if you're prepared to speak to the underlying bill and the proposed I, amendment, I can do that. Helpful. This is really sort of like compare and contrast moment. Sure, so I actually would start um, saying a few things about the findings in the underlying bill. I think it's unwise to speak as at, speak to PFAS as a class. Um, our knowledge as to PFAS differ depending upon which you're talking to. And some of the, some of the statements in these findings um, are inaccurate when they relate to the state's understanding. For example, um, subdivision four saying we need more research to determine health effects to humans from exposure of um, and environmental exposure to PFAS. There are five PFAS compounds the state disagrees with that on. So we have sufficient information to determine an adverse health, a, a correlation between adverse health impacts and uh, levels of PFAS in the environment. So I guess I would just say, would sort of caution um, folks speaking to them broadly as a class. I would also say that, um, that with respect to subdivision two, um, uh, there is a, a pretty broad set of commercial and industrial products that contain PFAS within the state, range, you know, coatings um, and commercial, other commercial products. So I just think it's important to, to say that that represents a very small subset of what is out in the environment um, in the stream of commerce. Um, so with respect to um, adopting a, an MCL. I guess the agency um, strongly prefers the approach that is in CLS proposal to the proposal here. Um, you know, it's, it's atypical for the legislature to adopt an administrative rule by statute. Um, and I guess my concern with respect to this is that every standard the agency has adopted with respect to PFAS has been challenged in court. And it's unclear to me how the standard challenges in the Administrative Procedures Act would apply to, uh, or the judicial review sections in the Administrative Procedures Act would apply to this section. Because the underlying sort of foundation that exists in administrative rulemaking will not have taken place. And normally some of those things from our economic impact statement, public participation, et cetera, are a basis for an administrative challenge to the, the rulemaking. So it's just, I think, 
there needs to be some additional thought and clarity given to what the interrelationship is between the legislature adopting a rule and the the APA and the traditional rulemaking process. It's it's not clear to me, and it raises concerns in my mind. But to be clear, the, but you're saying you're in support of the, what Ms. W just shared with us. I, we found, you know, we generally find it acceptable. I mean, I think that that the agency can live with a set of of rulemaking deadlines associated with the adoption of the consideration and adoption of the five PFAS compounds as MCLs. Um, so um, I guess with respect to Can uh, I check it? I'm just yeah, please. More, a little slow, more slowly than you're going. So uh, is it if we adopt as a temporary measure and uh, kick off a rulemaking so that there's this hybrid so that we can have an earlier effective date. Um, is that address your concern? Because the rulemaking process will have taken place. It depends when anyone would challenge the step. Well, I mean, setting, setting aside the, the interim center, I mean, I think there's some things that, um, that we would look at. First of all is, um, you know, when would people need to test the water system with respect to um, these MCLs? Um, we would, these are things that are likely going to be in the rulemaking. So when testing is required, do we need to have a, uh, a, a confirmatory sample with respect to that? Because PFAS testing is notoriously, um, there are a lot of cross-contamination issues associated with the manner by which you collect these tests, and we found that in a number of times when we've gone out and, and done these tests. Um, and then I, I think that then it's a question of, okay. And cross-contamination, you mean that the container itself? The container, the fact that you're wearing some clothing that's not sterile and it may have PFAS on it and it contaminates the container, so we'll see it in the trip blank and in the, the, the actual sample itself. So there are a number of cross-contamination issues that exist when you do this, and we've actually had tests come back positive when we've resampled them multiple times again they they show no PFAS in them and our best guess and, and, and that normally the, the sort of you use a set of confirmatory samples along with the actual analytical sample that you're taking to see whether there's a problem and, and uh, with respect to that analytical sample and we've, and we've seen that so there's been lab issues there's been clothing contamination or equipment contamination issues um, so the, those are things, I, so those issues, and then I think the question is uh, that we're going to have to as the agency resolve in the context of this rulemaking is um, uh, treatment, you know, and, and when do we apply treatment and how long do people have to put treatment on? Um, and I think the, the challenge is if anyone, you know, has gone through the, the drinking water uh, physical plant enhancement process, it's, it's not an overnight process. You'd have to go through the bonding process and so forth. So not all of these are likely to have an existing PRP who's going to be able to, assuming we find it, um, they're not all likely going to have a PRP who can do the work, a responsible party to do the work, in which case the community would bear the cost of doing it through a bond vote. And, and that's what an MCL does. Um, so, I'll just pause. If you have any other questions, or I'll move on to the, the surface water. So, so with respect to the surface water sample, um, our reading, my reading, and we haven't received a whole lot of guidance from EPA yet on what they've put out, is their 2021 deadline is a literature review to see whether we should set a drink or a, a criteria pollutant for standards, not the actual establishment of the standard itself. Um, and normally EPA, when it goes through that standard, the actual development process, they, um, they're not quick. They're normally five to 10 years of a process to adopt those standards. You know, the agency um, is comfortable coming back with a plan next year. We've already had conversations with uh, the state of New Hampshire and NUIPIC, which is basically the water program directors in New England and, and some mid-Atlantic states to talk about doing this, uh, doing the data collection, sort of the analytical work um, regionally, try to reduce costs and then have, you know, the states look at setting the standards individually, um, knowing that we're not all going to 
you know, Vermont may be looking at 20, New Hampshire's looking at 70, New York is at 10, you know, 10 and 10. So we're all kind of in different spots. And we think, we think that's an approach that can work. And we think getting it done by 2024 is frankly ambitious. I mean, that, that would cause us, we think it's doable, but it's ambitious. Um, and it, we think it gives us enough time to come back to you next year, basically with a report that says, um, this is what we would need to do. This is the staff resources and the budget we would need to do it. And these are the other entities that we'd be working with rather than just um, adopting something. So I've now served for, for many years with Senator McDonald, and this is the point at which he asked the question of, do you know how long World War II took to conduct? Or something like that. You should ask your own The U.S. involvement. Yeah. His participation in World War II would have been started and completed in less time than you're proposing the final, final rule. I can't speak to that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so. But you said that's the quickest you can. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess if, if the legislature wants to use its policymaking authority to, to adopt a standard without the foundation, the agency would go through. I mean, we're, we're going to set a standard the way the agency would set a standard for any other contaminant, which means that we're going to look at, at the, con the contaminant's impact on ecological species to determine at what level it's safe. You know, uh, that's, that's what we do. Um, it, we've talked, to, the chair and I briefly talked about the paradigm that which, within which the agency works, and we are a science-based agency. We look at, um, we both develop data and then also look at existing data in order to try and set standards that are protective of human health and the environment, but at the core, they're, they're based on what we know. Um, so it, this is going to, we are, not at a point where there are a number of states who are out in front of us where we can borrow from them and replicate this data. This is where we're sort of out in front. My understanding is we're out in front on this one and we'll have to be developing a lot of this on our own, which is why we're looking for other jurisdictions to work with. Um, this is normally a task we would leave to the federal government. Um, we are not confident that the federal government would move with the degree of speed which we think is appropriate here. Interim. So what's the interim standard? The interim standard for drinking water. Well, we're going to wait until 2024 to come up with a final score. So I can't tell you what concentration is the appropriate concentration for the five PFAS compounds in surface water. So in the meantime, while you're waiting to tell us that, what should happen to take place amongst our citizens. Well, I, again, I think that, that we've said that we're going to, we're, we're coming up with a plan to work as quickly as we can to get the data that we need to move this forward. We're not coming forward with a recommended interim standard because we don't have a foundation upon which to tell you what the appropriate number is. Um, well, we're, I guess uh, it's up to us then. So the, um, so the other things that are in the proposal that CLF laid out were um, a, a requirement for the agency to uh, finalize its testing plan um, and test for a total oxidizable um, PFAS amount in a, in a selection. We have significant concerns with the requirement to test for total oxidizable PFAS. Which is in S49. Uh, it's in the CLF proposal. It's it not in the underlying okay. bill. And you know, our concern is that this is not a quantitative test. It's a qualitative test. There's no quality controls around right. this methodology. That if you take two samples collected at the same time from the same source water and send them to two labs that run top assay, you will get wildly varying results from those samples. This is not a reliable test at this time. Top assay is used in other sort of fields, like with chlorinated solvents. My understanding is you would close chlorinated solvents and elsewhere, and it's been refined. It has not been refined at this point, and I think the agency would be concerned 
Um, there are a number of false positives from our, our chemists have basically told us there are a number of false positives associated with this test. Um, and until there's a better quality control around it, we do not recommend using it I, because we don't know what it tells us. Um, uh, is that because different labs are running different versions of that test? Like that's a well, there's, there generic is no, there is no there is no version of it. There's no sort of standard methodology. My understanding, talking with the chemists who've done work on this internally, is there's no standard methodology and set of quality mm -hmm. controls around this testing protocol yet. Again, we're sort of at, at the leading part of, of the science around this, and EPA hasn't developed. It normally goes through a process to develop a testing protocol. And then there's, there's consistency amongst labs. And one of the things that's really important to agencies using this in a sort of applied setting is we want to feel confident that the number we get is, is roughly speaking, repli yeah, replicable amongst multiple different labs. And we're, we're not seeing that with this methodology at this time. So I came <coughs> I'm wondering if Ms. Duggan would respond to that, the testing piece. Well, I would, I mean, I will agree that there is no EPA test method for PFAS mm -hmm. using this approach. Um, I don't have access to the same information that Ms., uh, Mr. Chapman has in terms of other chemists and what they are experiencing. I've just, you know, I've consulted with one lab that is running the test. Um, and I think I've... Doing this work. That's doing this work. Um, Where's that lab? Uh, they, there is a, Burley, it's Test America, so there is a Sacramento lab, and I'm happy to send a white paper on the test and more information. Thank you. And, that'd be great. Thank yeah. You. Okay. All right, so thank you. So, we, so we'd have concerns right. with that, but right. with respect to the rest of it, the agency, the agency is um, developing a, a testing plan currently um, we're going to prioritize sort of public assets, drinking water systems, wastewater treatment facilities, um, things that are near um, drinking water sources, and and we think that the time frame that's that's laid out is acceptable. Um, so I think the um, let's see, I actually don't have a copy of the most recent version. Thank you. That's not all in your notes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good idea. Chapman says this. I know, says exactly. that. I know it happens all the time. I've been dug in with all of it. Thinking. <laughs> um, so, the the last so the the so there's a section that basically requires that the agency adopt an interim uh, uh, establish this interim environmental in their environmental media standards for anything that's. Um, the health advisory has been established for, and, and the agency's supportive of this. Um, one of the challenges that we have as a science sort of emerges, and this is beyond PFAS, is trying to figure out what the scope of the problem and what the scope of the problem is with respect to um, that presence in the natural environment of a particular contaminant. And we think that, um, you know, while Mike's right, we could reopen permits and require people to test, this is a much more straightforward way and, and it basically authorizes us to test anytime there's a uh, an emerging contaminant that the health or the health advisory has been established for, and that'll help us prioritize um, which ones move forward to the actual standard development route and go through rulemaking, and which ones, frankly, they may be an emerging issue, but if they're not present and not a problem, and maybe less of a concern when faced with other challenges. I'd only add the other thing that this does is it, it allows the agency, if there is an sort of an imminent and substantial endangerment to, you, to human health or the natural environment to put conditions on the discharge of that particular um, contaminant. Um, so I, I will stop there. I guess the, the only other thing to sort of go, I don't, the only other thing that's out there is um, the change with respect to 6605 and landfill permitting. And I, I would just say I'm concerned about the proposal that is there um, for a couple reasons. One is we have five landfills in the state that um, generate leachate. They're lined uh, landfills with leachate collection. Um, we've talked about one. We haven't talked about the others at this time. Um, 
unlike other sort of industrial and commercial sources, you can't turn landfill leachate off. Um, it's not something that you can just punch a button and it goes away. This is uh, effectively water that's flowing through um, or has was infiltrated into a landfill. And so it, it, needs, it needs to be at some point pumped. The final, and frankly, the more technical issue is it's unclear to me what the standard is for the agency to authorize a wastewater treatment facility to take this leachate. It just says that the agency shall give prior approval to it. I think one of the agency's biggest challenges right now is you know, trying to figure out what the appropriate level for PFAS and frankly other contaminants are in surface waters um, to deal with this very issue. And we're, we're working on it, but we're not, we're not there yet. So I think that that- Those treatment plants aren't taking that sort of stuff out of the leachate, are they? You know, we're, I- Do we know? Seems to me if they're, if they're putting it into wastewater treatment facilities that there are some things that wastewater facilities are designed to take out. They're but not, there's a whole bunch of things in that leachate that they are not designed to take out. There's a whole bunch of things in wastewater that they're not designed to take out. Mm -hmm. And so I think the biggest challenge, so I, I would, I, I think it's clear, Senator, that the treatment facilities are not designed to take out PFAS, right? I can't tell you, there, there appears to be concentrations in sludges that are higher than either the influent or the effluent on wastewater treatment facilities. There's also, um, I, I think that everyone should acknowledge that um, landfill leachate is one of many contributing sources of PFAS to wastewater treatment facilities. Of a whole bunch of nasty That's right. things. That's right, agreed. So I'm not, and, and, they, and PFAS is one issue in landfill leachate and frankly in influent wastewater going into uh, a wastewater treatment facility. But I think sometimes, I think like the people think that, okay, it's been through a wastewater treatment facility and it's coming out clean, and I think we underestimate the number of nasty things that are coming out the pipe on every wastewater treatment facility. That there's a whole bunch of things that we don't test for, and there's a whole bunch of nasty things coming out those pipes. Well, I think when we first started on this bill, I said this is like a small door into a very big room with a lot of other things. Right, yeah, all sorts of things. Okay, so we need to stop there. Um, thank you very much for the walkthrough and the comments and answering questions. And we'll need to come back to it. I do. Uh, I do have a very short question. I'm going to break my own rule. So, why do chemicals live on the list as health advisories, and A and R doesn't choose to bring carry them over and turn them into MCLs? You know, it's a, it's a complicated question. I mean, I think the simple response is um, the trying to look at what the treatment technologies are that exist to treat those chemicals, what the cost would be to um, muni municipal drinking water systems. Um, normally that analysis takes place before we list uh, something that we have a health-based standard for as a, an MCL or a, a public community drinking water supply standard. Is that the incremental cost benefit? That's the, the, the typically yes, yes. Um. So uh, we have, uh, um, we're changing gears to so looking at the, the final, uh, the quote unquote final, I do believe it is final, version of the emissions uh, amendment for S84. As the drafter. So we'll need to get a, a cleaned up version for the calendar, but this one still highlights the last round. Can you close the door, please? Thank edits. you. Um, okay. So everyone should have draft 5-2, which is a little unusual. And that it still includes helpful reminders of what we were last adjusting on the work of this. And can you just please remind us again of where we settled on? Sure. And may I just ask a quick question? 
yeah, have we sort of, is there a, yes. a settle? Right. right. So this same process is being replicated or already happened across the hall. Beautiful. Oh, I and, see Maz's name's uh, on it. Right. Your name is on it. Right. I still, just for the record, support 10 years versus 15, but that's just me. Okay. So good morning for the record, Andy Dexter Cooper, Legislative Council. Um, as Senator Ray mentioned, this draft still has some highlighting indicated in what has changed since the last version you saw, which was 4.1. Um, so the only changes are that instead of there being that language, which I can read for you since it's not here, that says the Agency of Natural Resources and the Department of Environmental Conservation are supposed to try and get the lowest possible model year look back in their back and forth with the EPA, which would be paralleled in the rulemaking that happens by the DMV. This is just a 15 model year look back to be consistent across the board with what the state of Vermont is saying they want to have be their inspections and maintenance program. And in that same paragraph on the top of page two, we deleted the establishment of a goal waiver rate of less than 3%. Um, that would still be something that would presumably, and I believe Matt Chapman can speak to this, be part of the back and forth with the um, Environmental Protection Agency, but not wetting the rulemaking to that. By way of an update, Senate Transportation looked at this exact same amendment version this morning. They indicated that they would support this amendment. However, they too liked their earlier version of 10 years. So the, the uh, waiver rate of less than two percent. They're, I mean, they're going to support the amendment. They would support Period. the amendment if the amendment went forward in this version. Thank you. Okay. And by way of what we uh, compromised on was that, and here, as I understand it, the, the waiver rate of less than three percent is still inherent in 40 CFR 51 S, and could be achieved in those negotiations, but it's not explicitly listed. Is that the correct way of saying it, Mr. Chairman? The waiver rate will be a part of the program that is approved, or is contained in this. And there is currently nothing in the periodic inspection manual that even speaks to the waiver rate in that this program has only existed for about a month. It became effective January 15th of 2019. And then the 15 year model, 15 model years old or less piece was uh, transportation, I would say, was uncomfortable that the negotiations, they said, well, what if it led to an agreement at 20 years? So they wanted to know that coming out the other end, it wouldn't be any more um, permissive or re it burdens and whatever, however you want to say, depending on your point of view, than 15 years. So it's just written into the process. Interruption. So there is current, is there a current hardship waiver? Is, yes. So that's part of law. It is not a, it's not part of law, it is not part of the inspection manual, it's part of the Department of Motor Vehicles current practice based on session law in the miscellaneous motor vehicle bill and transportation bill from last session. It is not a hardship waiver, it is a high cost waiver set at $200 that is lower than what the implementing regulations for the Clean Air Act say it should be, and that is in part to try and have it um, be available to more Vermonters than a $900. Do we know if anyone one. has gotten it? Um, has anyone been issued that waiver? Yes. 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 Uh, do we have numbers on that? Uh, if you give me one second, I can. I spoke with a local dealership this weekend, and um, they found customers found it too difficult, very <laughs> difficult owners to get. And, you know, multiple phone calls, and the DMV to figure it out. The dealership won't deal with it. They put it back on the customer. Sure. They, they, they don't want responsibility. To deal with it. Yeah. Well, and that's what I was thinking is that the only people I've heard from are people who have had trouble at the place they're trying to get their car inspected. I haven't heard of anybody that has gotten the waiver or was satisfied with the process. 187 uh, waivers have been issued since. 187. Um, yes. Thank you. Oh. Well, one reason I, I mean, there are a number of reasons I support this, but I don't, I think we need these VW dollars, and I hear that we could be in jeopardy if we don't move in this direction. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
And I guess probably in part what transportation is thinking also. But the, my bottom line is that if they were actually testing the emissions coming out the end pipe and saying these cars are polluters, maybe I'll change my mind. But what we are testing is the test equipment. We're not testing the emissions. And so I'm going to stick with the 10 as well. Okay. Well, it's a very complex problem, and I, I, I have struggled with it the, the entire conversation because I don't want people not fixing small cost components because they can get away with not fixing them and it's to their own detriment. But on the other hand, I've just heard from so many of my constituents that the shops are giving them a hard time and they can't get through the process. Well, that seems like implementation more than what the underlying rule or statute or manual says. Um, but well, I, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing right, it, I'm just saying. It may, I'm just saying that if they have the 10 years, it gives them more leverage to say, well, what's the problem? How much is it going to cost? The, the garage can't say you have to fix this or I don't inspect your car. And that's what's happening in a lot of places right now. And unfortunately, I think it's being used in a lot of places to charge, to do work that doesn't always need to drive, done drive and, and because they have them over a barrel. I'm not giving you a sticker unless. And most people wait until last week to get their car inspected anyway. Yeah. Mine's due at the end of February. It's going in next week. I, so try, just, I try to so wait a couple extra days. To, that way you get the uh, next month day. every year. <laughs> Creeping along 13 months every time. <laughs> Here's a year. Yeah. Um, so we've been calling it a hardship waiver. Isn't it actually a if I've heard high cost. It is a high cost waiver. It so, is not a hardship waiver. The two types of waivers that uh, the EPA contemplates as part of the state implementation plan would be a hardship waiver and would be um, a high cost waiver. I believe in this committee, and it could have been in Senate Transportation, you heard testimony about difficulties in implementing the hardship waiver in that the DMV is not really um, in the business of confirming income and inspection stations certainly aren't in the business of confirming right. income. And um, I believe, and Jen, please correct me if I'm wrong, New Hampshire, there's one person who's sort of designated as the person who makes a determination on hardship. So under current law and practice and the amendment as proposed, we're not creating a hardship waiver. We're and how the, the high cost waiver exists in session law? You are not changing anything about the waiver program. The existence of the waiver program is a, um, due to there being language in session law from last year saying Department of Motor Vehicles go establish a waiver program. We need to go back and look at the language, but I do not believe that that set any parameters around the waiver program. And the waiver program was designed to go into effect on January 15th, 2019, which is when the conditional pass stopped being an option. And that was when, without regard to how much it was gonna to cost to fix your car, if you failed the ins emissions inspection component, you got a sticker and you were given a conditional pass. That was the same conditional pass you were given if your vehicle wasn't ready for the emissions component part of the inspection. And the reboot. It, it could have been that it was rebooted, it could have been that someone had tampered with it, any number of reasons why your car would not be ready. Um, so I, I, you know, I, to your point, Senator uh, Rogers, about it's, it could be the, the instrument, the sensor that's out, not the emissions that are out of whack. Um, I don't know, I don't know an answer to that. You know, be like, if you got pulled over and you could say my speedometer's not working, that's why I'm speeding, then well, that wouldn't make sense either. So. Well, if you're speeding, you're speeding. What I'm but saying is that we're not measuring, they have. Not you, well, working. Especially if you change your ratio of your tire. Well, oh, you're saying it's still working, but not accurate. That's, that's a possibility. And once you got a speeding ticket, you would know that it wasn't working. Unless the policeman pulled you over and said, hold it, what year is your car? Oh, you're good to go. Um, no speeding ticket. Because we don't worry about broken speedometers on older cars. So, you know, so we'll, we are where we are, but the- uh, Here we are. So if you're over 10 years old and the light's on, 
whatever. You would be, after this amendment passed, you would be subject to an emissions test. If the repair cost more than $200, $200 or more, you could ask for a high cost waiver, and in which case it would be granted once for that mechanical problem. And a year by the time your next inspection came due a year later, you either have to fix it or move down to another vehicle. Have we been through the process? Do we know what the process is to get that waiver? I How have. long does it take if you get your inspection a, last day of the month? filling out a form and sending it into the department and waiting for a response? Can, can you fill us in on how the $200 or more high cost waiver is executed? Certainly, I'll try and do a high level overview. So today, if you fail the test, uh, you are instructed that you will need to check to see if the, uh, to get a diagnostic performed to understand what the problem is. From there, you'll need to uh, understand if that is covered by warranty or not. So you'll need to check with the manufacturer's representative and or uh, understand and, and know that it's not covered because of its age um, or whatever. And then you'll need an estimate. The shop can then uh, take and ask you those questions. Do you want to apply for this waiver program? They will. Uh, put in the repair cost um, and uh, ask that the consumer has checked and that there is no warranty coverage available for that. And then um, they, today in the interim process, they call the 800 number and are asked, the mechanic is asked those questions and they respond to them. That will all be software based uh, by the end of next week or our current production's testing on that is going well. So that will all be in the software. The mechanic will end, ask, answer those questions in the software, take a picture of the estimate, and uh, business rules, again, what is it, greater than $200 was the vehicle, uh, failed for something other than readiness, and uh, was the vehicle not failed for having um, the DTC, uh, the, uh, Court, uh, tampered with and as long as all of those business rules are satisfied the software moves on to issuing a sticker wow well, can we record your testimony and have them play that to the customer while they're still in? <laughs> <laughs> we, we have been trying to get uh, information out on, on how to do that and there are uh, rack cards okay so, so who's eligible for a hardship well, so it's not hardship, it's high cost. Right. Who's eligible and it's for high cost? Everybody? Anyone with a repair that will be, a, the repair exceeds $200 or more. And, that's and your, those other conditions. And the conditions that No tampering, said. there's no warranty that could cover it for you otherwise. Did I get that right? Okay, I was listening. Having gone past that hurdle, your vehicle is now usable by you for how long? One more year. And after that year has passed? You would need to make the repair. Wait, 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 right. One thing that hasn't come up is the waiver is attached to the vehicle. So if in that one year you were to sell your vehicle without making any repairs, the person who bought it would have the remainder of that one year testing cycle to make the repairs or move on to another vehicle. They wouldn't be able to go in and say, well, this is news to me, I want another one year. So if you sold it to someone in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania, they wouldn't have to be tested if they sold it to them in the county in Philadelphia, you, they'd have to be tested. Depending on what the state inspection requirements are. So, um, so we're not going to vote this as a committee. It's no, just I, a, I, an amendment. I just, I, we, you know, most of us came into this committee room at the beginning of the, of the session, which was this was the year we were going to uh, make some advances in reducing. Yeah. and um, global warming and particulates in the air and, um, and the transportation committees were the ones who were going to be the lead on that and we're I, I'd like to get out of here with a net reduction in, in greenhouse
greenhouse gases and a net reduction in pollutants and not take this half a step backwards. Um, it is more polluting. But it seems to go right after our neighbors who can't afford new cars. And they get stuck with um, the repairs when they buy used cars. And in the absence of having some plan that gets less polluting new cars on the road for citizens to buy as used cars a couple years later, we're, we're just putting the burden on those safe people. So I think it's, it's until last, until the waiver program that was just created, was it not correct that all vehicles were subject to emission standard testing? All from 1990, model year 96 and on? Correct. So 96 and newer gas powered, and I believe it's 97 and newer uh, diesel powered, uh, and then there is a weight, a gross vehicle weight reading of 8,500 pounds or less. So this problem potentially has been there all along, and this is that we're have, seeing a higher incidence of reports of it by virtue of the fact that now we're doing electronic testing, things that somehow were getting passed are now being flagged because the onboard diagnostics flags without right. fail. Is so it? right, so correct. So there are no rules implement new no rule changes implemented with uh, the AVIP system, but it is the system is electronically collecting that data directly from the computer. No human is reading those results and then entering them separately. So, so no room for, uh, we might call it discretion. Correct. Okay. All right, so thank you everyone for filling us in on the details of this. Um, I'm gonna bring this up to the Senate Secretary be in notice calendar tomorrow when action Thursday. I think it's the schedule so everyone can see it. Um, and I thank you for helping. I, you know, Senator McDonald, to your point, maybe uh, you've been around here longer than I have. Uh, I don't know if we want to do something formally or informally. The formal might be that this committee might write to um, transportation and say, we'd like to work with you between now and the end of the session to see if we can develop a program that will offset these emissions so that it's not just one step forward, but as you said, you know, two steps, two, one step back but two steps forward, so we end up in a net positive on the emissions story, even though we're granting uh, uh, an exclusion to older vehicles. Senator I Ross. think an informal conversation yeah. around that. So we're not going to take a position on it? We're not going to vote? No, I wasn't going to ask for a committee vote. Just wanted to make sure people knew before they had a chance to walk through it. We've been looking at it. Because you and Maz are doing it together. Right, right. So that's, that's it. So that's really go to their committee. That's for how their it's vote. going to be offered as Just an amendment. Two individuals yes. are offering an amendment. Be free to vote the way they're going to vote. Okay. So thank you. Thank you again. So committee, we need to change gears again. Um, as you probably know, it's Vermont Housing and Conservation Order. Coalition. <coughs> and Partners Day in the State House. And so this committee, I'd say more than any other, does a lot of work that is, uh, has a connection to allies outside. And I'd like to invite uh, members of the coalition to speak with us. So uh, I think, uh, my, sorry, flipping pages. So we have three three guests for the closing 21 minutes. That's seven minutes apiece. They got to do math. Off we go. Um, Mr. Huffman, if you'd like to join us at the table. Thank you for your patience. Sorry that the uh, emissions thing was a little gnarly and took a little longer than we had that on our schedule for. <laughs> That's okay. Hopefully this piece will be a little less gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> a little more straightforward. Uh, I do have a set of... Um, copies of handouts that we provided electronically to the committee. Um, so there are, the, I think, desired seven copies of each of several different things. Are, are these all... different than the ones you gave us a few weeks ago? <coughs> yes, they are. Okay. So 
Uh, I'll take mine electronically. <coughs> and if there are extras, happy to take them back and make good use of them. So, uh, for the record, my name is Phil Huffman. Uh, I'm the Director of Government Relations and Policy for the Nature Conservancy in Vermont. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you all. Thank you for making time for us um, in what I know is a really, really busy time for you all, uh, and you're kind of uh, squeezing us in. We appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, my role alongside my Nature Conservancy one is as one of the co-chairs of the Housing and Conservation Coalition. Um, and then I'm also uh, here sort of as a uh, with my volu local volunteer hat on as chair of the Waitsfield Conservation Commission. Uh, and I'm really pleased to have a couple of star witnesses uh, who I'm going to turn it over to quickly so that they have a little more than some of my seven minutes. Um, but uh, our board chair from the Nature Conservancy, Lynn Bondurant from the town of Danby, who will be talking about a TNC project that's in the works. It's part of the pipeline of pending projects with DHCD. And then Cindy Carr next to her uh, from my town, uh, our town of Waitsfield, uh, who's been a wonderful community volunteer and activist on a recently completed VHCB project. And Cindy's accompanied by her husband, Al, uh, as well, um, who's been a huge part of our moving things forward there. Um, Welcome, and thank you for coming. Thank you. And then there are also a host of other uh, folks from uh, various parts of the coalition here as well. And. Uh, Couple of things that I'll just say, I won't go into the details of what's in my written statement, but would encourage you to look at it for more of the supporting information. Um, the ask that uh, we're here for today, not just with you, but with the legislature, we're in I think 11 committees all together, uh, is to uh, respectfully request uh, support for full funding for VHCB at the statutory level that's been required according to statute for a long time. 50% of the property transfer tax, which for FY20 would be $21.8 million. Uh, the governor's budget, proposed budget, takes things in the wrong direction and would actually result in a net cut of $2.5 million relative to current year funding. Uh, <clears throat> this is at a time where the pipeline of projects, current and pending projects for BHCB, is uh, at least as robust, if not more so than ever, their VHCB estimates there's something like $50 million worth of pending projects on both the housing and the conservation side that are in the works. Um, that's more than three years worth of funding at current levels. Uh, so we desperately need to try to bump that number up and to get to that full statutory level. Uh, I think you all have uh, a pretty good familiarity with the wide range of benefits that VHCB projects provide on the housing, affordable housing side, addressing critical needs there, and also on the conservation side for the whole host of things that this committee is uh, front and center on here in the Senate. Uh, and Could you uh, see us refocusing some of those dollars and saying the Vermont Cap General Council on uh, housing and conservation to just focus on water, given you know our work on water? Um, I, I think the answer is yes to a point. Um, so as you undoubtedly know, there's a significant amount of funding going through VHCB for water quality right, already, projects already. And actually, we were, increasing that. we were concerned to see part of the, the governor's proposal was to actually reduce that by $1.05 million from the capital side of, of the allocation. Um, that's going in the wrong direction. I think there is a need to increase uh, funding for water quality related things. And the, the range of pro conservation projects that VHCB helps to support provide really critical water quality benefits, um, both agricultural projects and forest land projects, the ones that Lynn and Cindy will be talking about, are illustrative of the way in which cons forest land conservation projects help to protect water quality too. Um, I think that I uh, just want to add one other point, um, which is, that uh, these VHCB investments are one-time investments that have a long-term, multi-generational impact. That's not true for many other also important state programs, but these are ones where if we conserve land, that's enduring, that's permanent. The benefits that that provides will stay with us for a long time, and that these projects on both sides, housing and conservation, always are bringing in significant leverage from other funding sources. It's about $4 of other sources for every dollar of state investment um, from federal and local governments, from the private sector and whatnot. So there's huge leverage. Again, that's not the norm for many other state programs. Um, I'm going to stop there. I'd like to turn it over to, uh, <coughs> to Cindy to speak for a few minutes about a project 
that we recently completed uh, in the town of Waitsfield that wouldn't have happened without VHCD funding, and we'll just try to keep an eye on the clock and keep things moving. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as we're <clears throat> changing chairs, um, I just want to catch up on my notes here. So the, the governor's budget proposal reduces uh, the property transfer tax uh, funding to you folks by how much? Well, it, it's, it's actually the, the combined package of uh, <coughs> Property transfer tax and capital bill okay. dollars would uh, decrease by 1.05 million on the capital side. And then this coming year, FY20, is the first year of debt service payment on the housing bond that was passed a couple of years ago. So with that, if we hold the line on VHCB funding, that million and a half is going to come out of existing funds. So it's essentially a net reduction of project dollars of another million and a half. So that's where the two and a half million mm -hmm. reduction comes from. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about the VHCB grant to the Bad River Valley. It was really important. The Gateway Project consisted of 110 acres, which may seem very small. Oh, well, it's small compared to 420,000 acres that's been <laughs> preserved. However, however, it's a really important tract for the Mad River Valley. Over 25 years, donors and a small purchase cobbled together 640-acre municipal forest. The forest has vital headwaters to the Mad River Valley. It has an incredible wildlife corridor, one mile of unbroken ridge line. It's scenic, you can see it from all over the valley, and people hiked it, biked it, hunted, etc. However, no legal access to this town forest except for a very small footpath. So, um, there was a 160 acre parcel adjacent to the town forest, but it had been subdivided. This is right here. So this is the town forest, and that's the gateway parcel in front. That's the part that was that's the, the part addition. Exactly, exactly. So to understand the neighborhood, upscale neighborhood, high-end homes, lots of pressure for development. So the parcel was um, subdivided into three expensive lots, unattainable for the town of Waitsdale. Too much money. So uh, the Safans bought the 160 acres late 2014, and they quickly realized how important the gateway parcel at the end was to the town forest. So they agreed to give the town a one-time opportunity to purchase 110 acres. They took two lots, combined it into one smaller lot, put one house at the very beginning, right here, and then the remainder of the property was available to the town. It was still a pretty big nut, even though they took a lot of money off. So um, we went to the Conservation Commission, we went to the select board, they were very enthusiastic. They said, this project isn't gonna happen without two large grants. So Liza Walker and the Conservation Commission um, put a lot of work into applying for the U.S. Forest Service Realize Legacy yes, Grant. Sorry. She's Liza. Sorry. The Vermont Land Trust. Yep. Partner. The Vermont Land Trust was our <clears throat> co-partner, helped us with all the fundraising, grant writing, and obtaining the VHCB grant. So that $125,000 grant, along with $256,000, was one of eight donations given by the Legacy Fund that year in the whole country. Um, so these guys did a great job. But anyway, um, so those um, those grants enabled us to go back to the, commission, the Conservation Commission and the Select Board, and they gave us their blessing. That Those grants enabled us to then go out and leverage individual donations. So we had a goal of 75000 We raised over 145000 the excess funds are going to a 10-year stewardship program and new trail building. Bottom line, economic benefits. Besides all the protections, wildlife, the ridge to river, erosion control, protecting headwaters, besides all of that, the economic benefits we have, we're leasing to a maple sugar operation, um, there's been a timber harvest, but I think the most important thing is the recreation. So we now have a parking area. We now have a trail network that's easily accessible by everybody in the town. And you probably all saw the Vermont Biz Report late 2016. So this was a study done by Vermont 
trail, trailways, trails and greenway um, uh, council, they studied four areas of trail networks and they discovered that $29.6 million was brought into this state just with those four. So this underlines how important just for recreation which ones, is. For, for and I don't know which ones yeah, they were. They yeah. didn't mention it, but this this report was published in the Vermont Biz Magazine. Yeah, which that's I, where I picked yeah, it up. I, I have yeah, it here. Yeah. I'll no, I believe you. I just yeah. 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 So so in any event, bottom line is um, we couldn't have done it without the donors, without the landowners, without the town councils, but most of all because of the grants, and especially VHCV. Terrifically important. So and thank they gave you. How much did VHCV? How much did they get? What was the total project? The total project was um, 700000 by the wow. time we got done, so we leveraged five to one. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, well, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Wow. Next, we'll have Lynn Bogger come up to speak about a pending Nature Conservancy project. Good morning. Thank you for Chair Bondurant. Yes, thank you. Committee members, thank you for having me here. Um, yes, I'm Lynn Bondurant, and I live in the town of Danby, Vermont, a little further south of here. Um, and I'm the volunteer chair for the Nature Conservancy Board of Trustees. Um, I won't go into everything that's in my statement in the interest of time, because you have that in, in writing. But um, I do my volunteer work for the Nature Conservancy because I believe in its mission, which is to protect lands and waters of which all life depends. And uh, so I appreciate all your efforts to work in Vermont and, and well, you're the ones that, that really do the job, so thank you. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm pleased to be part, a very small part of it. Um, so I'm here today to talk about um, the latest project to protect forest and waters of Vermont um, and the importance of VHCB funding to that. And this is a 3,500-acre parcel on uh, Glebe Mountain in the towns of Wyndham and South Londonderry. Um, you may be familiar with that parcel for a number of reasons. It was in the news um, around windmills and things uh, a while ago. I'm not sure what, what year that was. But, uh, um, but as long ago as 1990, TNC identified this Glebe Mountain parcel as a really important opportunity to protect a large and intact forest tract. Um, and over these many years, TNC has not lost its desire to do so and has been continually trying to make this happen. Um, this acquisition will safeguard a rich forest block for wildlife habitat. Not only does the site contain one of the most significant beach stands in southern Vermont, which we all know are important to our bear population for uh, food in the summer and the fall, um, but it's also um, important for the northern New England forest birds, such as the black-throated blue warbler and the black Bernian warblers. Um, the property is a mix of northern hardwoods and red spruce forest, and 95% of the property contains state significant natural communities. The project will also help improve water quality um, by securing nearly the entirety of the upper Cobb Brook watershed that flows into Hamilton Falls and Jamaica State Park and the West River. Um, in brook trout habitat and water quality, um, and this it's an A1 quality stream, um, will be protected and enhanced as we, uh, the Nature Conservancy works to remove culverts that are um, high above the water in many places and uh, adds, add large wood support to the healthy um, stream ecosystem. Um, it will also help reduce the vulnerability of communities downstream of, for flooding. The vast forest lands on this property will play a key role in absorbing rainwater in storm, uh, storms large and small and slowing the runoff of snowmelt. Um, and the restoration efforts in Cobbrook will help the stream to function more naturally. Again, that's putting together those culverts and letting the ecosystems function. So for the past 20 years, this property has been posted. It has been available only to a very exclusive few who had the uh, rights to hunt on that property. Um, it's kind of neat to go there and see some of the old hunting stands that, that were there. But it was very exclusive, and the public was not um, allowed to be on the property. Um, so this acquisition will now allow this property to be open to the public for perpetuity for hiking, fishing, snowshoeing, and hunting. 
Uh, we think this is really important as you know, countering that trend of posted lands, which keep people, you know, off of the land and off from enjoying it and um, and the well-being that comes from enjoying it. Um, so protecting large forest blocks like Glebe Mountain is a critical strategy in helping Vermont buffer the impacts of climate change. Glebe Mountain will help Vermonters meet the goals of the Agency of Natural Resources Conservation Design Program and by protecting our present biodiversity and also maintaining a network of lands that are connected and will allow wildlife and plant to move and adjust in a changing climate. Um, there is a map that some of you may have seen. Um, it's, it's been on social media. It's, it's comes, it was produced by one of our um, uh, scientists at TNC um, after a lot of research and it shows how as climate change is happening, how our um, species diversity is so important to maintain these areas where there is maximum uh, diversity for species and the types of soils and locations that Glebe Mountain is, is key. That's why it was identified in 1990. It's a pinch point. It's an important um, zone for climate change as species are moving northward and up, uphill as they're adapting to climate change. So this property is important now and, and extremely so into the, into the future. Um, Sorry, um, how big a parcel? It's 3,500 acres. <laughs> yeah, it's a large. It's 3,500 acres, and um, and the cost is 3.5 million dollars. Um, the total cost for the project estimated at four. Um, we w would be um, requesting 800 thousand dollars for the project. So as with Cindy's project, this is a five to one match for every dollar. Um, that we receive from housing and conservation, there'd be five dollars coming in from other sources. Um, I guess I'd like to add that, you know, um, in addition to my role of chair of TNC, um, my paying job is that I am the executive director for the Workforce Investment Board in Rutland, and uh, my civic duty is that I'm the chair of the Danby Select Board. And so, in both these roles, I see the importance of housing and conservation uh, constantly. Um, certainly from my employers in uh, Rutland County, I'm hearing always about the uh, need and the trouble of attracting young people to jobs that are critical for our region and that affordable housing is part of that. And then as uh, chair of the Danby Select Board, I'm trying to pass a budget that is uh, inflated by 4.6% this year because of the storm damage we incurred in July of 2017. Um, so I really uh, see you know, the importance of these forest lands for um, protecting into the future. And uh, um, you know, if, if, if we had had the systems in place that we needed naturally, we could have you know, foreseen nearly a million dollars worth of damage in our town. Um, so I urge you all to please support funding from the Housing and Conservation Board in accordance with the longstanding statutory uh, requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Quick question on uh, for your town. So as you're rebuilding, are you getting technical assistance and being able to rebuild in a more resilient manner? Yes, very much so, and very importantly so. Um, so we're working with FEMA as well as the Agency of Natural Resources, and we're working to um, rebuild bridges that were wiped out. They're being built to much larger specifications than they were before, and we're also looking at um, preventative measures on certain stream banks, um, as well as replacing other culverts with box culverts. And yeah, and they're big ticket items for our yeah. town. You know, so we, we, do get, we do get help from, the, um, uh, from FEMA and from the state, um, but still the, the dollars that are left to come out of our own pocket, even though we have a pass river corridor, well, we're trying to pass a river corridor, we have flood hazard. Um, you know, it's significant for our town, and our town is not a wealthy town. Beautiful spot. Yeah, I come all the way, you know, I pass by on my way because I have a yeah. center from Bennington yeah. County. The sign looked like yesterday, I don't know if you noticed. Uh -oh. <laughs> did you notice it may have been, did you notice did, or no? I didn't notice. Okay, did you no. think I should have stopped. I should have stopped. <laughs> I'll check it out on the way. No, no, don't. No. Snowplow fatality. Yeah, my <laughs> bet. It's been known to have one. <laughs> all right. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much thank for coming you. in. And uh, thank you to everyone for the work you're doing and for coming in and helping us uh, know some uh, stories from out in the field. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you again for your time.